So in this video, we're gonna talk about the Fresnel equations at some arbitrary angle theta. So in the last video, so at some arbitrary angle theta, in the last video we calculated uh, if I had some incident ele electromagnetic wave, uh, so it's got some amplitude, which I know because I'm sending it at whatever surface I'm interested in, and we were able to calculate how much of that wave gets reflected off of a surface, which we, uh, we use the symbol little r to denote. So we just get little r times ei reflected off the surface and little t times ei transmitted through the surface. And this was for uh, some refractive index material to some other refractive index material. So n1 to n2. Maybe this is free space. Uh, maybe it's air. Maybe it's uh, some other material. It can be anything. The, the equations that we figured out will work no matter what. But you might say, well, Jordan, I don't have a, a normally incident wave sitting around, but I can give you a, uh, a wave at a particular angle. So I can't give you a normally incident wave, but I can give you a wave at some angle with respect to the normal. And if we were using ray optics, which is often very convenient, this is described by some angle of incidence theta i. And so this wave is propagating downwards towards the interface. And so it's perfectly reasonable to ask, well, uh, how are R and T going to change? Are they going to be the same? Are they going to be different? Uh, are they going to have some angle dependence? And the answer is yes, they are going to be different. And we're going to figure out exactly how they're different in this video. So um, the, the trickiest part by far, I would argue, of figuring this out is dealing with polarization because there's a lot of different ways our electric and magnetic fields could be pointing to give us this uh, direction of propagation or this K vector. Because now we can have fields that have t components that aren't tangential to the surface. So this makes things a little more complicated. But let's just assume for now that our electric field is pointing towards us as we had before. Uh, and so the magnetic field then, if we're going uh, downward and to the right, uh, has to be pointed in in this direction, so sort of uh, downward and to the left. So this is our H field, and this is our incident H field, this is our incident electric field. And let's just redraw this below so that we have a less messy, uh, less messy world to deal with. So we've got some incident plane wave, and it's got some angle uh, with respect to the normal. It's got an electric field, which we said is pointing towards us. Uh, it's got a magnetic field, which is pointing sort of down and towards the right. And it's got a K vector, or a direction of propagation, pointed in the same exact way as we just said before. Uh, now, after it reflects, uh, we're going to assume, just as we did in the last video, that the E field doesn't switch its polarization, so it stays pointed at us. And uh, we know from the last video that it doesn't actually matter that we assume this. This is sort of just a convention uh, that we all agree to abide by. Uh, physics will work either way. So we've got H, we've got our electric field, and now, so this is our uh, incident field, this is our reflected field, uh, this is, we're also going to have a transmitted field which has some electric field ET, also this is ER, EI, and the a transmitted magnetic field HT. And this is going to have some different propagation vector uh, K, let's call that K2. Actually no, let's call it let's call it KT just to be consistent with everything else. And uh, need to decorate this H field. HI, KI, KR, KT. Cool, so we have everything we need. Oh wait, H, HR. Now remember, we're interested in what's happening right at this boundary. So what's happened right on one side of the boundary and right on the other side of the boundary. And so we're gonna use our boundary conditions that we've derived previously. Uh, and for no, uh, no charge and no current, uh, these boundary conditions just look like the tangential field on side one. So this is refractive index N1 and N2. So for side one and side two. Uh, the tangential electric field on one side has to equal the tangential field on the other side. And similarly, the magnetic field on one side has to equal the magnetic field on the other side. And that's with uh, no surface current, so k is equal to zero. 
And so equation one, our first boundary condition is fairly straightforward because the electric fields are always pointing in the same direction. So if we want to add them up right at the interface, uh, we're, they're just, they're all pointing in the same direction. So we just get to add them. So on one side, our incident field plus our reflected field has to equal the tangential field on the other side, which is just ET or the transmitted field. And since these are pointing towards us, these are all tangential fields. They're not, they don't have any normal component to them. Uh, but with the H field, it's a different story. So our H fields are now pointing off in different directions. And we would like to just figure out their tangential component. Uh, and so we can do that just with uh, fairly straightforward geometry. So this is our instant angle and our reflected angle is uh, the same as theta i, that's just Snell's law. So the tangential component of our incident field is just this part of the field right here, uh, which is just h i times cosine of theta i. And that's just the, the easiest way I know of how to do that is when theta equals zero, h points like this, and it's all tangential. And so cosine of zero is one. So this has to be a cosine. And similarly for the reflected field, it's a little more complicated uh, again because we're pointing in the opposite direction, so we have to subtract it. Uh, but that's okay; it's the same exact uh, same exact form. So h r times cosine of theta i, and this has to equal the tangential component on the other side. So h t times cosine of now instead of theta i, uh, it's theta t. So our transmitted angle, uh, this guy here, theta t. And so we can write everything in terms of electric fields if we like. So uh, remember that we can just convert from electric to magnetic fields, oh, that should be h, uh, just using the wave impedance eta. So on side one, we've got eta one, on side two, we've got eta two. Uh, and we can rearrange these equations then in terms of uh, then the refractive index. So eta is just equal to eta naught over the refractive index. And if you do that, the second equation will just become uh, n1 times cosine of theta i uh, ei minus er is equal to n2 uh, cosine theta t times et. And so we've got two equations uh, and two unknowns. And I'm going to divide everything by ei just to make things uh, even simpler. So if we divide everything by EI, then this just becomes one. Um, our reflected field, so we know that ER is just R times EI, or uh, ER over EI is just equal to R. So that's nice, that's a, a physical thing that we're interested in finding. So we've got one plus R then on the left-hand side is equal to T. And similarly, for this equation, uh, we replace EI with 1, ER with R. So we've got 1 minus R. And on this side, instead of ET, we've got T. And these two equations are really nice because they completely remove all the fields. So there's no more electric and magnetic fields. Uh, we just have everything in terms of the amount of the field that's reflected and the amount of field that's transmitted. So now it's truly two equations and two unknowns. And if you actually carry out, if you put these two equations together, you can solve for r and t, and you'll get that r is just equal to n1 times cosine of theta i minus n2 cosine of theta t divided by n1 cosine theta i plus n2 cosine theta t. And this is really cool because this is exactly, this looks exactly like what we got for normal incidence, except now we've got these cosines added to everything. So we've got cosine theta i, cosine theta t, but it looks almost exactly like what we had before, which was just n1 minus n2 over n1 plus n2. And if you wanted the transmission coefficient, you could get that too. Uh, this is just gonna be two n1 cosine theta i over n1 cosine theta i plus n2 cosine theta t. And this is again exactly analogous to the 2n1 
over n1 plus n2 that we got before. And so this makes sense because if you plug in theta i equals zero degrees, you should get what we had before. And indeed you do, so that's really nice. And so these are our two equations for r and t. Now a couple caveats are in order. Remember, we assumed initially that the electric field was pointing towards us. So uh, we assumed that it had a certain direction and that meant that the h field had both a tangential component and a normal component. Um, this is only one of the possibilities. So uh, this is what's called S polarized light, um, S polarized with the electric field uh, pointing towards us or equivalently pointing away from us uh, or stabbing the plane of incidence. So the electric field is either pointing uh, in or out of the plane that we're working in. And that might not have been the case. We might have instead had an electric field in our plane of incidence. And that would be referred to as P polarized light. Uh, P you can just remember as in the plane of incidence. But in general, if you combine S polarized light and P polarized light, you can form any kind of incident electromagnetic field. And so we'll go over P polarized light in a future video and figuring out how to figure out how to calculate the reflection and the transmission coefficients for that. You might have another question. Uh, what about the normal component uh, of our magnetic field? We never even considered that. Uh, and uh, I actually did the did this this morning. I was kind of wondering why why we never touched that. Uh, the answer turns out to be if you apply this boundary condition, so that the really that the magnetic fields have to be or the magnetic flux densities have to be equal on either side. Uh, and for a non-magnetic uh, material, that just means that the H fields have to be equal. So H1 is H norm 2. This turns out to give you that N1 sine theta 1 has to equal N2 sine theta 2. So it gives you Snell's law. If you were to apply your third boundary condition, then you'd figure out, uh, or I guess we should, this would be theta i and theta t as we've as we've had it. If you were to apply this third boundary condition, you would have found the relationship between theta i and theta t, and you would have derived Snell's law. And that's I thought that was super cool. I might make a future video on that as well. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like down below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.